Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. I welcome you all to today's session of the Hindu newspaper analysis to bring out the most important and relevant news stories from the Hindu newspaper for today. Also reminding you, as soon as this session comes to an end, all of you have to move over to our Telegram channel where we have a quiz based on the topics that we discuss right here so that you can revise whatever we have studied. Before we begin with today's topics, a very important reminder, I had reminded you earlier as well, once again reminding you, 24th of December will be the beginning of our All India Prelims Test Series. The first three tests for this will be free for everyone, so you can give those tests as well. All that you have to do to register for the entire test series is use the link given in the description of the video or you can also give a missed call on this number. All these tests come with a live explanation by the subject experts and also you will get your ranking and your scores based on which you can be sure that you are on the right track about your preparation. These are the topics that we will be discussing in today's session. The first two topics from the mains exam point of view are about the COP28. Now, whenever this kind of a session comes to an end, the climate change session of the UNFCCC, you will see the newspapers filled with these articles for at least one or two weeks after the session comes to an end. So today also, most of the important articles that we have in the newspaper are with regards to climate change talks, the role that India should play, what happened at the COP28 in the UAE. So the first two topics are about that. Then from the prelims exam point of view, we have a new story about how India has just got its fastest solar electric boat. Then there's an article about the WHO giving a warning about the use of e-cigarettes. A lot of people who thought that e-cigarettes are a better alternative to cigarettes, WHO has said that no, that is not the case. Then the Indira Gandhi Peace Prize has been awarded to two distinct individuals, that is activist Ali Abu Awad and pianist Daniel Barenboim. And in the end, European Union, that is the EU, has now agreed to start negotiations to induct Ukraine as a member of the group. So we'll be discussing what that is. Let's begin with the very first article. The first article, as I said, is about the UNFCCC's recently concluded COP28 at the UAE. We have had innumerable discussions about the COP28. I won't say that this article particularly gives you anything new that we have not discussed so far. We had a discussion yesterday as well, earlier as well, about how the COP28 has at least a final text without any concrete solutions to the problems that we are facing. Yes, there are some positives to have come out. For example, the loss and damage fund has been formulated, although it has a very, very low amount as compared to what we require. The countries also talk about transitioning to phasing down the use of fossil fuels. There are some takeaways, but as per the author, if you look at where we stand, if you look at the problems that we have, the amount of problems that we are facing, none of the problems have been solved as per the COP28. Now, the COP28 was extremely important for a few reasons. Why? The purpose of COP28 in, UN, in the UNFCCC's context was that it was supposed to take up the first five-yearly global stock take. Now, let's try and understand what this is. In 2015, we had the Paris Climate Summit. Similar to the summit that is being held in UAE, it was held in Paris. Now, in 2015, the countries made a lot of promises. We call them the nationally determined contributions. Every country made a promise that we will do this, we'll cut down our emissions by this much, we will increase renewable energy, so on and so forth. All the promises that were made in the Paris Climate Change Deal, the NDCs, were made to make sure that the world's global temperature does not go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. Maximum it should go beyond 2 degrees, maximum it should go up to 2 degrees Celsius only. It was agreed at the Paris Climate Change Summit that after every 5 years, the entire world will assess the progress made so that we can change our approach if it is required. So this Climate Change Summit that took place in UAE was supposed to be the first such assessment. That assessment is called the Global Stock Take, GST. Not our GST, Goods and Services Tax, but Global Stock Take. So it was supposed to be the first ever assessment 
of what the countries are doing. Are they on the right track or not? Do we need to change our approach or not? Now, in this context, it was supposed to be extremely important because it was supposed to tell the world, are we on the right track or not? Now, what happened here as per the author? If you assess what the countries have been doing, it has been proven beyond any doubt that we are not on path to achieve the 1.5 degree or even 2 degree Celsius target. The world's average temperature will in all probability go much beyond the 2 degree Celsius target that we have set. So ideally it was time to take much more drastic measures which have not been done at the COP28. Now, the COP28 that had to now give new goals, that had to give even stricter goals to the nations, has failed to do that. It should have at least made the countries bound to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. It should have made certain binding agreements so that the countries agree that they will cut down on their emissions, but that has not happened. In the entire COP, we saw a lot of focus on the usage of fossil fuel. We discussed this earlier as well, how developing countries, including India, do not want any limitation on the use of fossil fuel, specifically on coal from India's point of view. But the developed world wanted the phasing out of the fossil fuel. Now, if you look at how the COP turned out, how the COP was organized, there were question marks right from the beginning of it. Why? The first question mark was on the choice of the host country. The host country, the UAE, one of the largest producers of fossil fuel themselves, oil and gas. A large part of their economy is based on selling oil and gas. So if you're hosting the climate change summit in a country whose economy is very much dependent on the selling of oil and gas, how do you expect them to actually take a decision or bring a test which will con which will result into phasing out of the fossil fuel. On top of that, there were question marks over the president of the UNFCCC or president of this summit. For example, the COP28's president was Sultan Al Jabbar. Now, who is he? He is a minister in the UAE government. Not just that, he is also the head of Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, one of the world's largest oil and gas producers. Now, how do you expect a person heading one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world to take a decision telling the world to stop using oil and gas? This was a big irony. In fact, in one of the interviews, he himself had said there is no proven science that says that we should cut down on fossil fuel to tackle climate change. So when you have a head of a summit that does not support the idea that fossil fuel should be cut down, how do you expect to come up with a solution which tells the countries to cut down on fossil fuel consumption? That was the starting red flag. We all know how bad the fossil fuels are. They account for 75% of all the greenhouse gases in the entire world. 90% of carbon dioxide emissions are just because of fossil fuel. That is why it was time to take these drastic steps, which the nations have failed to do. We have just kicked the can down the road. We have again said, okay, we we'll look at it after a few years. Right now, it is a time for us to progress. This is a dangerous sign and everyone agrees to this, especially these small island nations, which are the most susceptible to rising levels of the sea. They are the ones who are the most susceptible against this. In fact, the small island nations said that this text is a death sentence for them. African countries, on the other hand, said that they want assurance on the funding part. EU, on the other hand, said that we wanted 1.5 degree target to be even stricter. But none of them got what they wanted. Now, there are two ways to look at this. Some people say the best form of negotiation is where Everyone thinks that they got something, but they did not get what they want. Some other people say the best form of negotiation is where everyone is left disappointed. For example, over here, the negotiations that took place in the UNFCCC to get the final text so that every country adopts it. This text actually disappointed all the countries. Some countries wanted assurance on the funding. They did not get it. Some countries wanted assurance on stopping the use of fossil fuel. They did not get it. 
some countries wanted no limit on the use of fossil fuel even they did not get it so in the end there are no clear winners as such the draft as analyzed by the experts who supported the use the stop use the supported the phasing down of fossil fuel according to them the draft does not have clear cut definitions the draft does not tell the countries what to do going forward it uses a lot of vague language it uses a lot of words which are not defined properly there are clear danger signs going ahead for example as per the global stock takes report the developing countries need 5.8 to 5.9 trillion dollars for pre 2030 period out of that adaptation alone will require 215 to 387 billion dollar per year now imagine how much money is required to tackle climate change and compare that with the funds that the developed world is ready to give we discussed this yesterday as well the loss and damage fund which the uae is very happy about see we have established this fund but the reality is the loss and damage fund is not even 1 billion dollars it is not even 1 billion dollar when the requirement is close to 6 trillion dollar so there is no match between the requirement and what is being proposed the author says that no one is happy at the end of this summit and the unfortunate part is that this is not new most of the climate change summits in the past also have not brought any new hope for any country the only one who may be happy with this is the fossil fuel industry maybe they were the only ones who were happy because their business is not going anywhere their business is bloom in the coming years in the coming decades now as i said again unf triple c summits are the premier body where climate change discussion negotiations take place the cop 28 is not the first such meeting where important matters were discussed in the past also some extremely important matters have been discussed in certain cops for example we all talk about the kyoto protocol time and time again that tried to bring in legally binding commitments for the developed world it was an outcome of the cop number no. 3 in kyoto a cop has also taken place in india cop 8 new delhi where new delhi declaration was introduced where it was underlined that there is a need to transfer technology to the developing world to allow them to fight against climate change similarly we had the famous paris climate change summit the cop 21 in 2015 this is where india along with france established what we call as the international solar alliance this is where yearly finance of 100 billion dollar was pledged by the rich countries a promise that they have not fulfilled even today so all these summits in the past have been either empty promises or no promises at all even when the promises were made they have not been fulfilled so there is no guarantee that even if the promises were made at the unf triple c cop 28 in uae that they would have been fulfilled going forward also these are the major takeaways from this year's cop if you want you can just go through them so that you have enough pointers to remember and to quote in the answer what are the major takeaways from here about the fossil fuel transition loss and damage fund global goal for adaptation tripling of the nuclear energy output transition from coal also the champ initiative which stands for coalition for high ambition multi level partnership climate finance etc if you want you can just see this is a summarized version of most of the major takeaways from this year's cop the next article again is on the same theme it's an article based on an interview taken from two experts their views were asked about how india is performing when it comes to these negotiations at the global level now the hindu newspaper very often publishes these kind of articles where there is an interview of two or more than two people uh, at times on a certain topic over here the name of the person is not really important for us it's not important for us to remember who said what what are the arguments given by one person or the other person for us to understand the topic it's more important just to understand the text the context behind it 
and also what are the important pointers that we can quote going forward. So while discussing this also, we will not be focusing on what point was made by speaker number one or what point was made by speaker number two. We will mainly be discussing what, what exactly is the context of it. So the overall theme here of these people who have been interviewed, they are saying that yes, the COP28 or the Global Climate Change Summit have always fallen short of where they should have ended. We have never been able to get the goal that we thought we would achieve in the beginning. But the reality is something is better than nothing. At least establishment of loss and damage fund, however small it may be, at least it is a beginning in the right direction. Would you have preferred no fund at all or at least setting up of a fund where at least someone could have held some help? Secondly, yes, the climate change summit did not talk about shutting down the coal mines. It did not talk about the use of coal. But at least it talked about transitioning away from fossil fuel. Again, this is where you would have to pick and choose your victories. You may not have to wait for a big victory all of, altogether. You have to pick small victories wherever you can get them in any battle. So over here in these summits, you have to pick where your small victories were. And the small victories are here. At least we were able to get this text of transitioning away from fossil fuel. At least we were able to get loss and damage fund established. The author also says that it's not as easy as it sounds. A lot of countries around the world offer subsidies for, for the use of fossil fuel. For example, if you go back a few years, the government of India offered subsidy on the use of diesel. Because diesel was mainly used for tractors, trucks, etc. for transportation, for agricultural purposes. So the government of India used to offer subsidy on diesel. Diesel prices were artificially lowered. Many other countries also do that even today. In Pakistan, for example, or other countries where fuel prices go up, they have to make it affordable. So they give subsidies on all of that. Now, this becomes a problem. When you subsidize something which is bad for the environment, it increases the problem even more. Because on one hand, you are harming the environment. On the other hand, you are spending your own money to harm the environment. That becomes even more complex. For India specifically, coal is extremely important and we have discussed this earlier as well. We are a net importer of a lot of fossil fuel. We import 80% of our petrol demand, 50% of our gas demand and a whole lot of coal also is imported. Now India has been making a lot of efforts to make this industry self-sustainable. We have been exploring a lot of coal mines in India. We have been giving up push to renewable energy. But again, the reality is despite all these efforts, about three quarters, about three fourths of India's energy demands are still met by coal. See, understand the problem where the problem that solar suffers from. We have made great strides in using solar energy, producing solar energy. The problem always has been the storage part. Where do you store solar energy that you produce in the daytime to be used in the nighttime? You cannot possibly have so many millions and millions of batteries. Even to make such batteries, you will again pollute the environment. So it's not that easy to store solar energy. The other problem or the other idea is to go towards, for example, green hydrogen. But that's again a work in progress. Any new technology, any new form of energy initially will always be expensive. It's only with time that the scale goes up and the cost comes down, it becomes affordable. So we have to wait for that transition. The other point that many people make is why not focus on nuclear? Nuclear can be 24-7. It does not have to be only in the day. It does not really have to be very expensive. Yes, nuclear is lesser expensive, especially as compared to green hydrogen, etc. But the problem is with nuclear energy, many countries have different points of views. For example, in the past few years, many European countries have been shutting down their nuclear power plants. Countries such as Germany, France, Japan, most of them are trying to go away from nuclear energy because they think it's not that safe. So that also creates a question mark over the use of nuclear, over the expansion plans of nuclear. And with nuclear also, India will always be dependent on importing fuel. That is the nuclear fuel. We will always be dependent on importing nuclear technology. That becomes a problem also in the long run. So at least right now, 
there does not be there does not seem to be a ready made alternative to the use of coal at least for now for india the other idea that the authors here are making is one of the other reasons why it's difficult to ditch coal for india is that coal as an industry also gives employment to a lot of people coal as an industry is extremely valuable for us for example coal yes has environmental consequences but the coal sector in itself is about 50000 crore output in india's gdp while the solar sector only has an output of 7000 crores in our domestic economy so economy wise number of jobs that it gives the employment that it provides in that sense also coal is much more lucrative for us although it has its own environmental implications but it's difficult to ditch it just to go in favor of solar yes india's air quality is extremely bad our air quality standards are much lower as compared to what the who has prescribed but again we have to ensure that we make our transition away from coal in a gradual manner rather than being a shock approach or taking a shock approach now there is one other thing that we have to understand here whenever there is a global summit be it the climate change summit or the wto summit the developing world looks at india as a leader because see when india demands something or negotiates an agreement at the global level we are not just doing it for ourselves we are doing it on behalf of the developing countries now here also a lot of developing countries were of the view that india should also go ahead and contribute to the loss and damage fund why if you look at the overall glo- emission if you look at the overall emission india is one of the largest emitters in the world overall i'm not talking about the per capita emission so many countries think that india should also contribute to the loss and damage fund the point is we don't contribute to such funds but on a one to one basis we do help countries with technology transfer helping them with new kind of stuff for example in bangladesh along with india along with russia india is building their first nuclear power plant in rupur similarly we have held a lot of african nation with transfer of technology sri lanka india's iit madras is setting up a campus in zanzibar all these initiatives have been taken by india so india does not contribute financially to such global funds but that does not mean that our contribution towards this cause is any lesser because india runs a lot of these programs under which we help a lot of developing countries lot of least developed countries to adopt new forms of technology i have told this earlier to you as well india runs a program called the itec under which we help a lot of developing countries with initiatives such as scholarships technology transfer etc your homework for today is read about itec tell me in the comment section which country is the largest recipient of help from india under the itec under the itc program which is the largest recipient of help from india do search about this and let me know in the comment section so again coming back to that point india has always been at the forefront whenever it comes to climate change negotiations we have negotiated not just for india but the entire developing world yes we don't contribute to such funds financially in terms of hard cash but we do help the countries whenever we can on a one to one basis and there are multiple examples of that what india demands at the global level rather than every country contributing rather than only the rich countries contributing what we demand is equity now what is equity in simple terms we support the fact that every country is responsible to fight against climate change but the parameters should be fair you cannot judge and compare the countries on different parameters this is what india's argument has always been i'll give you some facts so that you can understand this better now india has often been criticized by the western world as being one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases if you look at the overall numbers that is true it's not false but look at the reality inside those numbers for example india emits 7.3 percent of global emitted 7.3% of global greenhouse gas emissions in 
high number yes agreed but now compare that with india's population india's population is close to 18% of the world's population so if 18% of the world's people are emitting only 7.3% of the world's greenhouse gases means it is much lesser than the global average not just this if you look at our per capita emissions last year india's per capita emissions were 2.76 tons of co2 less than 1/6 of the per capita emissions of the us less than 1/6 one step ahead 24 times smaller than qatar qatar which is the world's largest per capita emitter world's largest as compared to that india's per capita emission were 124th 1 by 24th now imagine how fair is it to now force india to contribute to such funds while much much more richer countries like qatar and the us are the ones who are responsible for emitting much more greenhouse gas into the atmosphere also if you look at our standard of living it is far below us and qatar there are innumerable reports to show the widespread poverty in india so at that point of time expecting india to take the hard measures to transition away from coal and not letting these countries do their bit is unfair on india and on the global south overall that's a point that india has been trying to make these are the couple of articles on the mains exam point of view again both of these are about the unf triple c if something significant does not happen in the coming few days you will see a lot more articles on the same topic being published in the next week or 10 days now the question here is if one topic repeatedly comes in the editorials time and time again do you have to read all the articles on that topic i would say not really because not a lot of articles would tell you something new if you think that you have already covered whatever good pointers were discussed in the summit the bad and the good i think going forward from tomorrow onward you can skip if there's an article specifically on the unf triple c cop 28 because there will be because understand as long as a newspaper does not get another big news another new topic right editorial on they will still keep on repeating similar kind of articles but it's not important from your examination point of view we have already covered almost all the pointers from this i don't think there's a need for you to take up any more of that data because that will just be a repetition of it anyways from the prelims exam point of view <coughs> the first news is that india's fastest solar electric boat has been launched called the barracuda b a r r a c u d a for those who don't know it's a name of a fish it's a very very fast floating fish that's where the name has come from in fact indian navy also has certain ships by the name of barracuda it is said to be india's fastest solar electric boat it has been launched designed by a company called navalt and it can ferry up to 12 passengers in cargo so it's not a very long it's a very small sized boat it is 14 meters long four and a half meter why you don't have to remember that part the company that was behind this that is the navalt solar electric boats is a very famous company in this field it has recently won the world's best startup award in mobility and transportation category as well it also won the very very famous gustav trove award twice now i'll tell you about that award because this is more important for the examination point of view but this is not the only such initiative that india has done in the field of solar and electric india has been focusing a lot on introducing solar electric boats in the past few years let me give you a couple of examples in 2020 india launched first solar ferry in in the global context it was called aditya in fact it became very successful it represented asia in the same gustavo true award event it did not win the prize but it was a part of this this Gustavo Goof Truff Prize as we are talking about is named after Gustavo Truff a very famous French electrical engineer said to be the first person who thought about electric cars and boats he has about 75 patents in his name he was the first one to develop a 5 meter long electric boat as back as in 1881 
So do remember this name, the Gustavo II Awards. They may be asked because award-based questions have now become common in the prelims exam. Also remember the name Aditya, it is India's first solar ferry. Let me ask you a second question of the day. The first question of the day was about the ITEC. You had to tell me the largest recipient of aid from India. Second question that I have is this first solar ferry Aditya connects which two places? Ferry from where to where? Because ferry means it basically takes or ferries passengers from one place to other. Tell me in the comment section this Aditya solar ferry goes from which place to which place. Also, just this year, Kerala government also launched a solar power tourist vessel. That is also in the news. It's called Sur Yamshu. Do remember this name as well. Sur Yamshu. It is Kerala's first solar power tourist vessel. So again, the governments across the country, state and the center government, both have been focusing on the shipping sector and introducing technology such as electric and solar here as well. Next article from the WHO, bad news for those who are consuming e-cigarettes. I hope none of you is a part of that group. A lot of people in the past few years have tried to offer e-cigarette, hoping and thinking that it's a safer, healthy alternative to cigarettes. But WHO says that that is not true. WHO says that e-cigarettes may not be as harmful as cigarettes, but they are still extremely, extremely harmful. They also use nicotine, so they can be extremely dangerous for your health and the countries should take steps to ban the use of these e-cigarettes as quickly as possible. The e-cigarettes are not as effective as we first thought to quit the use of tobacco. It also has negative health impacts. WHO says 34 countries have already banned e-cigarettes while 88 countries have no minimum age where e-cigarettes can be bought. This is a problem. In India, we have already banned it. In India, we have a law called the Prohibition of Electronic Cigarette Act of 2019, which has banned the possession of e-cigarette. So if you have e-cigarette with you, it's a punishable offense under this law. If you have it, throw it away right now before the government watches this. Apart from this, the WHO also says across the world, Children of much lesser age than 18 are now getting addicted to this idea of e-cigarette. 13 to 15 year olds are using e-cigarette at higher rates than adults as well in all WHO regions, which is a very, very, very disturbing fact. It doesn't mean that the adults are not smoking. What it means is adults are smoking cigarettes while the adolescents and the 13 to 15 year old kids they are opting for e-cigarettes thinking that that's not harmful, but that is not true. In fact, in UK, the number of young users of e-cigarettes has tripled in the past three years. WHO says that e-cigarettes also have nicotine, which is highly addictive and harmful to your health. It may cause your lung cancer, uh, it may cause lung cancer, it may have a harmful impact on your heart as well. So the countries must take steps to ban the use of e-cigarettes as much as possible. The law that we have in India that bans the use of e-cigarettes is Prohibition of Electronic Cigarettes Act. As we discussed earlier, it's an act that was introduced in 2019. It says, electric cigarette is any electronic device that heats up a substance with or without nicotine and flavor. So again, even if the e-cigarette does not use nicotine, in that case also it will be called an e-cigarette only. This law prohibits anyone from Producing it, manufacturing it, importing, exporting, advertising, selling or distributing e-cigarettes in India. Again, it's a punishable offense. You can be punished with a term up to one year or a fine of one lakh rupees or both depending upon your offense in this case. The next article is about the Indra Gandhi Peace Prize. It's an annual prize which is awarded especially to those people who have played a major role in establishing peace in some part of the world. This year, this prize has been given to two people collectively, Ali Abu Awad and Daniel Barenboim. Now again, this is not a government award. <laughs> the name would tell you itself. If it would have been a government award, the name would have been changed. The Indira Gandhi Peace Prize is given by Indira Gandhi Memorial Trust. It is 
usually headed by the person who is the head of the Congress. In this case, it is headed right now by Sonia Gandhi. So what it does is this award is given to people in India or outside India who have played a major role in bringing peace in some part of the world. These two people have been chosen for their contribution to in helping youth and people of Israel and Arab world to come together on a non-violent resolution to the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict. They have been working in this field for a long time. It's not that they have just started their work. They are recognized for their peace efforts in this part of the world. There's a proper jury that is established to decide who will get this prize. This jury this time was headed by retired Chief Justice of India, Justice T.S. Thakur, who have chosen these two people. This is not the first time that these people have been awarded. In 2014, Mr. Awad co-founded a local Palestinian Israeli initiative called The Roots that promotes communication, that promotes people-to-people -people contact between Palestine and Israel to find out a non-violent solution to the ongoing issue. Now, the Indira Gandhi Prize, as I said, it's not a government prize. It's run by a trust called the Indira Gandhi Memorial Trust in her name, started in 1986. The winner gets a 25 lakh rupees award with a citation. It's given to individuals, organizations who are working in the field of peace, development, etc. It's not restricted to India. It's given to people outside India as well. I'll give you two interesting examples of this prize. As I said, not just individuals, organizations also are given this award. So amongst one of the organizations that were given this award recently was Pratham. Pratham, the same organization that publishes the all uh, the annual survey of education report, the ASA report as you call it, the report that tells you class 5th students can't read class 2nd text or 50% rural students can't write and read. Those kind of reports called the ASA report are published by Pratham only. If you look at the list of recipients of this award, you will find a very interesting name. And that interesting name is Rajiv Gandhi. So son of Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi himself was given this award. He is one of the recipients if you look at that particular list. There are other very important established people as well who have been given such an award for their contribution in the field of peace around the entire world. The last news that we have is that the European Union has agreed to start negotiations to induct Ukraine in this group. Now, European Union, I'm sure all of you are aware about the European Union. How does it work? How integrated it is? European Union is a group of these European countries where they don't recognize borders for trade, movement of people, etc., investment. For example, if you have to go to European Union or EU, you just have to take one visa, that is Schengen visa. And on that one visa, you can travel across the European Union without needing to have any specific special visa. Similar is the case for work visa, etc. as well in most cases. It's said to be the most integrated of all the economic groupings in the entire world. Ukraine has been wanting to be a part of it for a long time, but it was not able to start negotiations. Why? The primary reason was in EU as well, in order to make any change or in order to induct a new member, every EU member has to say yes. This time around, the person who was not ready to start negotiation with Ukraine was the Hungarian Prime Minister. Hungarian Prime Minister, Mr. Viktor Orban, he has been much more supportive of Vladimir Putin and Russia as compared to other European countries. He has criticized Ukraine time and time again. He has said there are a lot of problems in Ukraine, there's a lot of corruption in Ukraine. He has been openly against immigration in EU. He has said that whenever EU brings in new refugees, Hungary will not take anyone. So he has been, although a member of the EU, but he has usually been seen as someone who favors countries such as Russia, who favors countries such as China. So he is a character which is unlike most of the other EU leaders. So he was the one who had been stopping the negotiations to go on with Ukraine. But now what has happened is he had said that, OK, if all the other countries agree, I will not stop. You can start the negotiations, but I will still repeat the fact that I don't think this is the right time. He says that Ukraine should have first ended the war, only then the negotiation should have started. But 
after the pressure from all other 26 members, he said that, okay, I am also willing to give my vote. Now, the good part is, and the European Union members have also said that we appreciate Hungary in not stopping the process. The Hungarian Prime Minister again has repeated that, okay, I am saying yes, but I still don't think it is a good idea. Others thanked him for not acting in the veto power manner, for not stopping the negotiations to go ahead. So negotiations between Ukraine and EU have now started so that Ukraine can be integrated as a part of the EU. But now please understand, starting of the negotiations and a country eventually becoming a part of EU is a very long process. It may take multiple years before Ukraine becomes a part of the EU. So it's not that just because the negotiations have started, they will induct Ukraine very soon. It usually is a long process. It will take a long time. The question also is, how does a country become an EU member? So again, if you look at the website of EU itself, the EU website itself says it's a complex procedure and it does not happen overnight. This is a language I've taken from the EU website itself. It says that you have to be ready for a long time. You have to fulfill multiple conditions. You have to fulfill something called the Copenhagen criteria. This is important to remember this. Copenhagen criteria is a criteria that the countries have to meet in order to become a part of EU. Some of this includes you have to be a democracy, you have to follow rule of law, you have to follow a market economy model, no interference from the government, you have to accept all the EU laws, you have to accept Euro, etc. Only when all of these conditions are acceptable, only then the negotiations will begin and the negotiation again can take a long time going forward. These are the Copenhagen criteria. These are mainly three. Do remember. First, to ensure stability of institution that guarantee democracy, rule of law, human rights in your country. Second, to have a functioning market economy and the capacity to cope up with the competitive pressure within the union. Because once you become a part of EU, you become part of a much larger market. You will have much more competition from other countries. Would you be able to handle that or not? And third criteria, ability to take on the obligation of the memberships, whatever the entire union decides in terms of the laws, in terms of the economy, in terms of the currency, you have to accept all of that. Only when you accept these three criteria, you will be eligible to become a part of EU. These again are called the Copenhagen criteria. Do remember this. This brings us to the end of today's discussion. Here are a couple of practice questions on the theme of what we discussed. As I said in the beginning, as soon as the session comes to an end, go over to our Telegram channel to see what the quiz for today is. The quiz is usually based on the topics that we discuss every single day. If you have still not become a part of the Telegram channel, the link is given in the description of the video. Do click on that, become part of the channel so that you can get all these quizzes every single day. Thank you so much for watching. Do join us tomorrow as well at 10 a.m. for the next session of the Hindu News Super Analysis. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.